Reshaping Investment Management. The conversation will now commence. I'm Richard Hope, Global Co-Head of Investments at Hamilton Lane. It's a pleasure to be here today. I have a very experienced panel uh, alongside me, and we look forward to talking about the rise of alternatives. Specifically, we will look into the $8 trillion world that is private markets, and so I'm looking forward to having this conversation with my colleagues. So on my, on my left, um, I have Fatima al Nuimi, Co-Head Mubadla Capital Solutions. Next to her, I have Natasha Brooke Walters, um, partner and co-head of, uh, co of investment strategy at Wellington Management. Um, alongside, I have Don Cornwall, CEO and co-founder, Dynasty Equity. And next uh, to him, Badad Bali, managing partner and co-founder, Clear Lake Capital Group. And last, but not least, <laughs> Tony Manella, uh, founder and president of Eldridge. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I believe there may be an iPad later for questions. I don't have that yet, um, but uh, my goal here is to keep this discussion in the world of alternatives fluid. So I'm going to start with Natasha. And so Natasha, um, you're a very long established manager in the world of asset management. You're incredibly well known um, in the context of this 60-40 portfolio. So can we just talk a little bit about how you've evolved your alternatives platform, and also, is the 60-40 portfolio, portfolio dead? Yeah, well, thank you for the question, and lovely to see you all. Um, 1928 was when we launched the 60-40. <laughs> it was considered innovative at the time, but the world has moved on, as have we. In 1994, we opened our first hedge fund, which is still running today. And in 2014, we established our private capabilities. One big theme, though, that when we started that balanced fund back in 1928 that I think is still critical today is really two things. The first is diversification, and the second is getting access to global economic growth. I don't think that's changed. So when we think today about what does 6040 mean, or what does it mean to get access to GDP growth, or even better than GDP growth, plus having diversification, that's still really important for how we think about investing. What has evolved is obviously the use of alternatives as part of your asset allocation. And I think everyone here in the audience today would agree that that's a critical component. And that's exactly how we've evolved our solutions. Um, so when we think about today, the access to structural change and growth continues to be important diversification, both from how you generate alpha, and we're going to have some fabulous examples today, I think, of different ways to access growth in the world. But the other side is also really important. So why are you investing? Is it, do you need cash flows? Do you need income? Is it to hand over wealth to the next generation? So when you think about diversification and building solutions, all of those components are important, which is exactly what it used to be like in 1928. Ah, nicely started on 1928 and nicely finished on 1928. So, Tony, I'm going to come to you next. So, so you and your founders um, have a long history in the world of insurance and, and asset management. Just tell us a little bit more about Eldridge and your approach today in, uh, in private investments. Sure. So, I, uh, I, like a lot of people in the room, I started my, my career in investment banking, um, you know, in, in, in working with corporations and clients. You know, quickly, you know, saw that it was be a lot more interesting to be at a corporation or, you know, be at an investment management business. And so, you know, Todd uh, and I really started the the credit business at Guggenheim in 2001. You know, built an investment management business there over the course of, you know, 15 years uh, that we were very proud of. In the credit crisis, had an opportunity to you know, acquire some insurance companies. Uh, we knew the insurance business you know, really well because the biggest client of Guggenheim uh, was a, a firm called Salmon's Financial. Um, and then a few <laughs> years later, Todd raised a bunch of capital and we acquired you know, Security Benefit and set up Eldridge. And 
you know, really what we you know, need to do at Eldridge is find good investment opportunities to feed our balance sheet. You know, one that started at the time of demutualization around $4 billion and is now $54 billion. And so, you know, we've taken, you know, great pride in, in, in building businesses. Um, we've built a number of them. We've sold a handful. Uh, we have uh, five today um, that, you know, originate diversified um, investments that, you know, feed the insurance company's balance sheet and, you know, co-investors and, 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 and clients alongside of us. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, Fadima, I'm going to come to you next. So, clearly delighted for the room. We have one of uh, Abu Dhabi's sovereign superpowers on stage. So, so thank you for, for being here with us. But maybe, can you just tell us why private capital, private markets investment is important to Mubadla and also the LPGP mm -hmm. approach that you take to the market? Sure. Well, uh, before I um, go into my answer, I just want to say thank you so much for having me today. And it's an honor to be among my fellow panelists. Um, we're unique. So I'm part, I co-had a, a business called Solutions and Mubadara Capital. I think one thing a lot of people don't know about us is we actually manage third party capital as Mubadara. And uh, if I go back to 2011, when we were incubated inside Mubadala, we were predominantly an LP. Every single asset manager who'd come through the region would pass by us as one of the big sovereigns here. So we'd see everyone, we'd talk to everyone. We were what you'd call a professional LP. <laughs> and I think over time, what we realized is as we started investing and becoming a more and more active co-investor, that the portfolio we created as a sovereign was very special and other investors would want access to that. And in 2016, we decided to raise third-party capital for the first time. And that inflection point of going from an LP to a GP was very interesting because we sat on the other side of the table. We know exactly, exactly what investors look for and how do you now go uh, and design something um, with that framework in mind. So fast forward to today, we manage about $20 billion of assets, and we do so across four businesses. We continue to be an LP, but we're predominantly a GP. And I think that speaks to a, a dynamic happening in the market where you see a blurring between uh, the line of LPs and GPs. We wear both hats, and it's very interesting to be able to... Um, navigate the market, especially with, with the dynamics happening today, <coughs> uh, while being uh, or wearing both hats. And sometimes I talk to investors as a GP trying to fundraise, and other times I talk to them as an LP looking to invest. So I, I think we're uh, quite different in the way we approach the market. So graduating to become a grown-up asset owner, um, exactly. having looked at the market for, for all this time. So, so Don, going to come to you now and talking about the world of sort of asset owning. And so, you know, you're one of the more nascent firms here today. I, I don't mean that as an insult, but both you and your co-founder, you've got long history in private equity and sports. And so maybe just tell us a little bit about Dynasty and also why sports has emerged as a sort of central platform of your private capital approach. Sure. I'll start with the second part um, and I'll go into Dynasty. So sports for, look, we all, everybody in the room knows sports, right? And many people in here have been fans for a long time, have friends who are fans. Uh, what I think is new to most in the audience that it's an asset class. Uh, and I, I grew up in the sports business and I've seen over the years the asset values continue to, to go up in a, in, a, in a pretty meaningful way, in an uncorrelated way, right? Good times and bad. And what's happened is that the assets have gotten so large that capital formation has become a problem. And so what I see is really three reasons why private equity exists in sports now and what we're uh, focused on. Number one is just buying a team, right? And you guys have seen the headlines. These are large checks. And it used to be that a, one human being would go and buy a team for $100 million, $200, $300 million. Now when a team like the Washington Commanders is selling for $6 billion, you need more capital. And so what we'll see over time is that individuals will still buy these teams, but they will be backed by institutional capital. And large providers, maybe like Clear Lake, like an Aries, like Carlisle and Blackstone, they will come in with some sort of security, mostly structured, uh, to help finance the acquisition. The second thing that's happened is that as these assets have gotten bigger and bigger in terms of value, they've also been passed down from generation to generation. So they're family-owned assets, and you look up, and you've got a third generation, and you've got lots of siblings and cousins who own one, two, three percent, 
it's very illiquid. And there's no ability for them to get liquidity. And many of these owners are not wealthy. They're wealthy because they have this one piece of paper, but the rest of their lives, they actually don't have uh, a lot of liquidity. And, you know, I used to be a banker and I tr people would come to me and say, hey, can you sell 3% of XYZ and team? And I'd say, it's really hard to do that, right? You've got a piece of paper that's worth $200 million. There's not an individual out there that wants to spend 200 or invest $200 million and get nothing for it. But for us as objective, rational capital, if we can get in at a good price, that's an investment we'd love to make. The third thing, and this is what's the most fun about what I'm doing, is that the, the world of entertainment and consumption of entertainment is changing, right? We all know about streaming. We've seen Amazon, Apple, uh, other technology companies, we'll talk about AI in a moment, come into the sports world. Uh, and a lot of the owners, especially in North America, who are in the third or fourth generation, may not be as sophisticated. Uh, and they need help, right? Trying to figure out, okay, how do I navigate through this tough period? I, there's a lot of upside, right? Because technology is coming in, but I don't know how to access that upside. So we, as private equity team, can help with that. And so, you know, Dynasty, uh, founded by myself and my co-founder, a guy named Jonathan Nelson. Many of you may have heard of Providence Equity. Uh, he he built that firm. He's now stepped back from that and is my uh, co-founder here. We're focused on the second two. So we're focused on providing liquidity and secondary transactions to, to shareholders and then primary capital to help owners that want us uh, to help them navigate through what's an exciting period but also a complicated period. But, but interesting, the capital source is not in the public markets. You've yeah. identified the gap in the private markets. That's right. It, yeah. and, and look, over time, we will see more public market equity. There is, a, there is some. Uh, you know, Formula One is probably the best example of that. Manchester United is another. Historically, for the most part, most public sports teams have been ill-structured. The, the shareholder base is not good. They have not done a good job of courting people like Wellington. They, they, it's very, it's lots of hedge funds only. Uh, it's not what I call a good long-term capital uh, cap table. Uh, over time, as these businesses mature, I think we will see some public, some public market stuff. Okay, thank you, Don. So, Badad, coming to you. So, uh, sorry, we kept you waiting a while before you can talk. Um, so, Clear Lake Capital, you co-founded it's extremely highly regarded private equity firm across you know, various different sectors that, that, that you're experienced in. But maybe just give the audience some indication, what is it you're offering clients in the world of private markets today? And, and specifically, how are you approaching the market given the, evolu you know, the evolution of what's going on out there? Sure, thanks for having me. Uh, uh, yeah, to your point, we've been super fortunate, obviously, to have started, actually Jose and I started the firm in 2006, and. Uh, for the most, most part of our existence, uh, you know, we've been living in a different macro environment. We'll, I'm sure, get to that in a minute. But uh, at the core, we were sector-focused, control investors in, in TMT, you know, tech, software, industrials, industrial services. So sector-focused, but entry-point agnostic. So we could do value buyout, structured equity. We could buy credit, right? And uh, for most of our Existence, we've lived in a zero interest rate environment. You know, private equity as an asset class, which, you know, frankly, I give a lot of credit to Mike Milken for actually being, <laughs> you know, one of the founding fathers of get private a lot of equity, enabling, <laughs> enabling, enabling the high yield and the debt uh, for the past 50 years largely has been an asset class that's outperformed, uh, partially due to, frankly, the, the, the availability and use of debt leverage and uh, a lot due to improving businesses and fundamentally running, operating, and improving businesses better, right? I think uh, we're certainly big participants in controlled, you know, buyouts and private equity, but I think where we differ a bit is uh, we're able to buy credit, do, stru you know, do structured equity, and again, coming, coming to 2024 here, uh, first time probably in 20 years where we're going to live with an interest rate environment that's not zero, right? whether the Great Recession or COVID, we've largely had zero or close to zero base rates, and now we're entering a kind of a new, new environment that, that is, is going to be different, and inflation is persistent, and, and sovereign balance sheets are very different than they were across board, right? So I think, uh, you know, for us, we look at, you know, a trillion plus dollar of, of B minus debt, you know, B3, C debt that was issued, maturities coming up 25, 26, 27, We've largely, in the past 17, 18 years, done buyouts. Um, but, you know, there's going to be a new environment, and I'm sure Tony will get to some of the work there, Eldridge is doing, and uh, 
where we can step in, we can refinance, bring capital to there to restructure businesses and restructure balance sheets. Maybe in the businesses, these are a lot of good businesses that have bad balance sheets. So the reason we deserve to exist, I think, is we certainly do, I think, buyouts well. We have a good operating capability. We know our sectors well, but I think we bring in an ability to, to bring capital to, to really go through this, what's going to be, to some degree, a great recapitalization of a lot of balance sheets, the balance of this decade. And, and, and I want to come back to you on that point, because at Hamilton Lane, we hear a lot about the fact that private markets has consumed zero interest rates forever, 15 plus years, done extremely well. But then we navigate to a new environment, 5% rates, whatever it is. How are you setting up your organization in order to cope with that? Because that takes a different sort of investment discipline in order to invest the capital and, and generate those returns from the industry. Yeah, no, listen, I think uh, it's a bit of a slow-moving slow train wreck in that we all saw coming, but, uh, you know, you try to address it, I think, for us, back to 2020, you know, 18 to 23, I think our approach was try to buy well. I think our average creation multiple was about 11 times cash flow. I think uh, we tried to invest in assets that are, we think, uncorrelated to, to you know, the, the economy and the consumer. Um, so I think... True. Having said that, I think, you know, we are going to, all of us will take some degree of multiple contraction in a, in a world that rates aren't zero. Uh, I think, you know, for us, it, it's been, and again, the good news is a lot of these are good businesses. They perhaps took on too much debt, but they, there's no covenants, right? So maturity becomes a real catalyst for a balance sheet change. I think we've been hyper-focused on whether through cost takeouts, through growth, you know, organic revenue growth, inorganic growth acquisitions, try to build better businesses, more resilient businesses, I think, for the industry. And I'm, you know, I'm still bullish in the private, private equity market, and I still think we're in the early innings, early quarters of, uh, of, of, that, of that ability to improve businesses. So I think, you know, I think we're going to have a chance to do that. I think some of the excesses, whether leverage or multiples, We'll, we'll work through the system next three, four years. I want to make one more point. If we look at public markets, and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts around, you know, Wellington and mutual funds and the public long-only kind of asset class. Uh, 20 years ago, hedge funds, long-short equity hedge funds were thriving. Uh, we've largely seen a, a flight to index funds, you know, a quant funds, uh, market cap to to you know, fit one of those buckets and have the, enough trading and enough liquidity is probably, probably 50 billion or so. Uh, for us and for a lot of the upper end of the mid market or large funds, the large buyouts tend to be two, three, four, five billion, right? So there's a lot of gap to take businesses, perhaps that are good businesses but aren't growing, uh, you know, 20 percent. They're not hyperscalers. They're not you know high market cap businesses. Buy them take them private, run them better, and, and frankly exit to some of those $20 billion companies that want to be 50 to fit into some of those indexes. So I still think there's a long runway to go in private equity. I think we're going to look back in 2030 and, and, and 20, the 24, 25 vintages will be good, good vintages in private equity. So I think that the, the, the secret here, though, is when leverage is lower, when uh, rates are higher, when economic growth is slower, the best way to get good performance is just pay less. <laughs> and I think we're seeing... You heard it here. <laughs> uh, you know, so that's the, I think that's the, that's the magic, I guess, uh, sauce. I would say in, the, in a world today in the U.S. that uh, m multiples are, are up and the public equity markets, S&P, NASDAQ, are up this year. Private market valuations are actually down. Uh, and it's more anecdotal based on deals we're seeing in the market. So I do think, again, you're going to see a lot of the public market, uh, you know, quick, uh, you know, frankly, correction and a potential uh, slowing or a soft landing or a harder landing or a recession that we're, we're likely going to experience is going to affect private market values. And, and I, I do think the next two, three years will be interesting markets, whether you're doing Credit, private credit, I'm sure we'll hear a little bit from Tony about that, or private equity will be interesting markets to invest in. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the rate question is the first one that we get, and the valuation is the second yeah. question, yeah. which is, are valuations going higher, are they going lower? And please tell me they're going lower. <laughs> I think people are expecting that. So Natasha Badad was trying to bring you into the conversation there, uh, talking about the long-short equity business. But you know, in, in our prep, we, we talked a little bit about your research teams. So. Mm -hmm. You know, what are your research teams telling you, 
you know, about the investment business today, and, and, and maybe to address some of Badad's points, are you seeing some of that, and, and, and how, how is Wellington sort of investing there? So it's interesting to, to hear you guys talking about the valuations and how important it is to be careful about deployment of capital. And if I listen to our private investors or our public investors, the conversations are the same. So it's all about looking for those companies that are run really well, and either you help them get better, or they're already good and they need help getting to the next stage. Um, so the engagement is really, really important. And Wellington does over 21,000 company meetings every year. So that's a huge uh, benefit of being able to listen and learn. We'll come on to AI later. But the big themes that all of us are talking about, and I love the conversation about the sports as a new asset class, um, but this is about where GDP is going, where excitement <coughs> is going, where humans want to spend their time and their money. So you're capturing big themes in the market. And the continuum, I think, between public and private is really quite blurring whether it's dealing with the market volatility that's increasing because inflation volatility is here to stay. And I got, um, I was lucky enough, sort of lucky enough, to be in markets going into LTCM. So being on trading floors and seeing what liquidity can do, what markets can do, how the impossible can happen. And so when you're advising your companies or thinking about raising raising assets, I think it's all about making sure that you're really strict and careful with the valuations. You can help companies become more resilient, whether it's giving them advice about cybersecurity or helping them think about ESG, helping them work with your teams. All of that, we can, Wellington can rely on our global industry analysts to help our portfolio companies. Um, but the more I hear about the themes that are driving markets, the more I think there is more of a continuum between public and private. And when we think about thematic investing, it is along <coughs> some of the lines that you guys are talking about. Financials, technology, um, less so about sports, although I think that's all about how do you spend leisure time and, and more people getting to have more time to be able to do the things they love. So all of these are, all of these are based on GDP growth, structural changes, how the economy is evolving. So, so that's how we, we've been using it. Great, thank you. Wonderful insight. Uh, Tony, I'm going to come to you, and, and Donna, we'll come back to sports in a minute. Um, but, you know, Tony, specialized mar private markets managers, they've got a proven ability to identify market inefficiencies. Maybe just give an insight, where do you see those inefficiencies today? We talked about your asset management experience, your insurance experience. Maybe help the audience understand that today and, and where your, your team are spending their time. I mean, right now you can get you know nine to eleven percent yields in top of the capital structure credit, as you know, but audit alluded to. Um, you know, companies that are that are good companies that have over levered balance sheets um, need access to liquidity, and you know, there's a, a, a specialty chemical <coughs> business uh, called SI Group that we just put you know a hundred million dollars into. The bank debt's trading at eighty cents on the dollar. The bonds are at fifty. Um, it's got a two billion dollar, you know, capital stack, um, and the private equity sponsor actually, you know, is is trying to preserve, you know, their option to control the business and have the chemical cycle come back. Um, you know, we're going to be living with the consequences of COVID for an extended time period. Um, there was a massive amount of liquidity that came into the system. This business, you know, reacted and built massive inventories. And it's going to take time to you know, work those inventories down. And so what they've done is they've sold off a bunch of receivables to PNC Bank. And they sold us you know, two of their, two of their you know, biggest assets um, you know, to chemical plants, in, in te one in Texas and one in, in New York, uh, you know, 50 acre plus kind of facilities um, that you know, are insured at you know, a billion dollars worth of you know, value. And we're earning roughly 13% by providing a highly, you know, illiquid structure transaction where we actually purchase those, those plants and lease them back to the company. And regardless of, you know, whether that private equity sponsor wants to continue to own the business um, or, you know, the lenders or bondholders end up, you know, entering into some, you know, either outer court or in court restructuring, you know, I am highly certain that lease is going to be affirmed and they're going to want to continue to operate adjacent to their, 
you know, A-rated, uh, you know, chemical, they're A-rated customers that, you know, have the, that have the offtake. And so, and, you know, it's opportunities like that that, you know, we can, we can identify through our, you know, various teams that we're, uh, that we've built uh, to really to invest our, our own balance sheet. And that type of, you know, asset fits well in inside of structures uh, that, that uh, security benefit our insurance company you know, invests in and, you know, other insurance companies and, and, and balance sheets are interested in, in participating in. So structured teens, debt returns, that has <coughs> got to eat the equity returns in that business, but better to play in the debt <laughs> in that situation than the equity. Don, um, as I would come back to, to sports, so, so maybe coming to you, so we're touching a little bit on high rates and the effect on returns. Maybe just give an insight into what that means for the the sports investment so asset class that's emerging amongst a number of our colleagues on the panel today, but also out there in the broader industry. Yeah, we're, we're fortunate in that the sports asset class generally is not correlated to broader markets. And so we don't see a whole lot of impact on higher rates. And there's a few reasons why that's the case. Uh, number one, in North America, there's actually throttles on leverage. So it's generally just a low leverage environment. Uh, and that will continue to be the case. The league structures actually mandate maximum debt amounts uh, because what they don't ever want to see is a team go into distress, right? So they actually artificially make it such that there is not a lot of debt. That creates opportunity for us, right? Because there needs to be liquidity. That's where we can come in. Uh, the second thing uh, that you see is that these teams have long-term guaranteed revenue coming from a plus counterparties, right? If you think about who the, the counterparties are, it's Comcast, it's Apple, it's Amazon. On sponsorship, it's McDonald's, it's Delta Airlines, it's Etihad, right? It's, it's, it's entities that are not going anywhere and they're long-term contracts. The third thing you see is that you've got a fan base that even in good times and bad times <laughs> is still going to support their team, right? Yeah. People will give up their Starbucks lattes, but they're not giving up their season tickets, right? They're not giving up their cable because they want to watch their, their, their team. And so when you add that all together, even in, a, in, a, in a, a difficult interest rate environment, we see continued upside. The other thing that's interesting is that the scarcity value of these assets, right? There's probably only 200 teams in the world that matter. Uh, and when one of them comes up for sale, you'd say, well, if it's a higher interest rate environment, then the price is going to be lower. It's not the case um, because Take Washington Commanders. Uh, Josh Harris has coveted that team for a long time. He's from the region. Uh, he knew if he didn't buy it this year, he would never have another opportunity. Somebody else would have bought it, and, and it would be gone forever, so he had to pay the price. Uh, and we as investors benefit from that dynamic because when we sell, we're selling into that change of control. Sports are real crypto. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I love that comparison, maybe, but actually maybe. Bitcoin's up, so yeah, it's fine. Maybe, maybe just the loyal fans, and the loyalty of the fans cannot be underestimated, I, I, I suspect. But, yes. um, but Dad, co coming to yourself, so, you know, 2021 out there, I think, is probably the biggest ever year for, for private markets, but it was a, a big bounce po post-COVID. As, as we all know, 22 was the year of the public market volatility, 23 seen a lot of recovery in the public markets, yet Silicon Valley Bank goes to the wall, Credit Suisse goes to the wall. You know, who, who would have thought that we would see those things happening this year. So maybe just talk a little bit about the, the credit cycle, if you will, and how, how you approach that as, as, as your own firm. Yeah, no, I think, uh, uh, you know, I would say there's been a trend probably the past 20, 25 years of the, of the banks, the banking system really not holding corporate debt, and that's been effectively offloaded to the balance sheets of CLOs and sovereigns and BDCs and you know, insurance companies and, and, and private lenders. So we're seeing, you know, that uh, accelerate, frankly. I think, to your point, the Silicon Valley Bank, uh, First Republic, community bank, smaller bank, you know, the, the really, and effectively, if you think about it, that was a mismatching in, in buying U.S., you know, government-backed <laughs> securities, which will be money good, but they were 2%, and now risk-free rates 5%, and it's marked at 60, 70, whatever it is, depending on duration. So it's a duration mismatch. So that there'll, I'm sure, be case studies about why these banks failed, but the ultimate effect is going to be more stress in terms of lending to the small business, to the car loan, to the home loan, et cetera. So you are going to have the economic pressure that's going to, that's going to induce in the U.S. We're going to see in 24, 25. I think back to your question, 
you know, kind of where do we go from here, right? I think it's really twofold. I think one, it's unwinding the, the, the hundreds of billion dollars of, of buyout debt per se that was, that was issued. And again, I, I do think there are a lot of good businesses that maybe had bal bad balance sheets. You're going to grow into it. You're going to go to Eldridge and other lenders and, and, and get, you know, super, super senior or, or asset sale, you know, financing to, uh, you know, work through your balance sheets. Uh, I, I think, you know, where do we go on new buyouts? And I think this is where really we, we think the market is changing and you and tranche lenders and private lenders, you know, are, are, are squarely right this second to the primary source of, of, of credit available in the markets, not syndicated, uh, you know, bank debts, uh, uh, bank, you know, kind of syndicated broader markets. I think that's going to change, um, you know, w when rates do stabilize, maybe go down a bit. Um, but the good news is leverage, leverage will moderate, terms will get tougher, et cetera. So I think we're going to look at a market that's more sustainable, more, more viable. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it ultimately leads to the buyout activity continuing, but I'll be at a, probably a more reasonable outcome and pace. And there was a lot of times in the past three, four years where we would bid, take software companies at 20 times cash flow and we would be insulting the seller, right? And I think by any <laughs> historical measure on this, you know, you're growing, you know, at a high, high double digit through infinity, that, that deems, that, that's deemed a high multiple, right? The, the deal never made sense, right? And I think we, we saw ebbs and flows of that in 99, 2000, 2007, 8, 8, 16 to 17 to 22, especially in the, in the tech market. I think a lot of that, you know, kind of is working through its way in the system. And I think we're going to take the rest of the decade to unwind that. And I think the, the core market is healthy. It's really that excess that needs to work through the system. And I think, I think it will. Okay. Thank you, Badad. So Fatima, I want to come to you and I want to have you reflect a little bit on capital scarcity. You know? mm -hmm. And so private markets, you know, what, what we see as a business at Hamilton Lane is the sources of capital flowing into the industry are changing. So North American pension funds, UK pension funds, once upon a time banks, were big sources of capital into private markets. Today, you know, we, we hear and we see, you know, the Middle East, Singapore, Mexico as the sort of new sources of capital or increased sources of capital into private markets. So you sit here, as I said, you're one of the superpowers here in terms of your capital. Maybe just help the audience understand what it's been like this year and really the pressures you face and, and calls on your own capital in order to invest? Well, the short answer is we've never seen anything like this. I think um, what Behdad and Tony said is the perfect backdrop for my um, answer because as investors, um, you really sense that there's so much competition for capital. Yeah. Uh, we are definitely seeing a lot more activity and inflow of managers to the region. And what's interesting is one of the strategies I manage is called uh, Abu Dhabi Catalyst Partners, which has an added layer of investing with managers who want to set up an office here in the ADGM, where we are today. And not only are we seeing a lot of um, activity around capital raising in the region, we're seeing a big appetite to actually either move or expand into the region yeah. on the back of this. So it's twofold. And I think it's a good problem to have. But I think because of the dynamics happening in the market, as an investor, we have an added lens when looking at managers. Have they really been able to create value in the businesses that they've invested in, or did they just ride the market for the past 10 years? And, and that's, uh, that, I think, um, is what a lot of funds are struggling with now. Uh, add on top of that the fact that uh, there is um, there is a lack of DPI in the market, which a lot of investors want to see. So the dynamics create um, an investor market, one where a lot of invest, uh, a lot of GPs are giving investors a lot of special deals, or inv GPs are uh, deciding to raise smaller funds. And obviously, it's great to be on the receiving end of that because you enjoy the perks of uh, management fee discounts or co-investment uh, deal flow and so on. Um, that said, I think we're in it for the long game. We've been doing this for the past 15 years and we're not going to stop for the next 15 years. So I think, um, to Behdad's point, I think this is definitely uh, going to be a very interesting vintage. Uh, it's definitely one where we want to choose our partners carefully. Uh, and I think looking back uh, 
10 years from now, we're going to be glad that uh, we had um, an open ear and we were good listeners and partners uh, to managers. Okay, thank you. Certainly, if you go to any of the local hotels here, if you're from New York or London, you probably meet more people in New York or London <laughs> than uh, you do in any New York or London hotel. So uh, <laughs> lots of familiar faces in the region. Tony, um, c c coming to you, I, I just want to turn and talk a little bit about technology and technology in the industry. So you, you operate in the world of insurance and, and asset management. At Hamilton Lane, we've said a lot, private markets need to do a better job to invest in technology. And... You know, this industry too long has been sort of fed by Excel spreadsheets. And so there's, there's faults in those, there's vagaries in those, and so better invest in systems. So, so two specific questions for you. One is, you know, what are you doing at the company level in order to improve the technology that, that you have to your hands and the companies have to their hands? But, but secondly, and we have investors and potential investors in the room, what are you doing to make it easier for those investors to access the asset class? So uh, first on your second question, for investors to access the asset class, we've, uh, we've invested in a company called uh, Capital Asset uh, Solutions, uh, Integration Solutions. Um, you know, CASE is what, it's, what it stands for, C-A-I-S. It's, it's a technology platform that allows uh, independent, you know, the independent wealth channel in the U.S., which is trillions of dollars of... Of, uh, of capital to access alternatives. And so, you know, Aries, Apollo, Millennium have products that are on the case platform. Um, and traditionally, independent wealth managers don't have access to, uh, to, to products that, you know, the bigger Wall, Wall Street wirehouses, you know, have access to. And so we have, you know, or, you know we, we, this platform and it's a theme that we think it, you know, certainly makes sense for, you know, our clients and, and, and customers over the longer run. You know, to be able to access alternatives, um, you know, and they have a, a, a platform to be able to do that and invest directly in the fund, much like, you know, Movadala does directly in, 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 in funds. And so we think that's a product that, you know, resonates and makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, in terms of deploying uh, technology, I mean, we've, there's a couple of different ways that we're in the process of deploying technology at our businesses. One, uh, we have a business called Zinnia, which is an insurance uh, tech business. We've made a handful of acquisitions in the, in the, in, in this, you know, vintage. And I think this vintage is going to be fantastic, you know, likely across the board in 23, 24, because capital is scarce. But we bought a business called, you know, Policy Genius, which allows, um, you know, consumers to access policies in the <coughs> online marketplace. Um, Zinnia started as an out, as an outgrowth of Security Benefit. Security Benefit originally started as a mutual in, in Topeka, Kansas back in 1892. Um, you know, they, they built a, a tech platform to be able to, you know, distribute their insurance products um, and started to, you know, in, in the 2000s, started to service, you know, third-party insurance companies in addition to the security benefit, you know, business. And so, you know, we've taken that, taken that platform, invested heavily in it, um, and, you know, and, and, you know, made some acquisitions. And we think that, you know, right now we're in the process of deploying t uh, artificial intelligence uh, in our call centers, um, and that's taken you know that's it increased the, the the service level to uh, to to the to the policyholders, and you know can automatically summarize a call and can escalate a call to the extent that you know that person that's on the phone with the policyholder is incapable of you know solving the problem, and so you know the benefit to not only the carrier and the consumer is. You know, it's, you know, is uh, is very tangible, and the final thing in technology that I'll I'll, I'll touch on, we're in the process of uh, closing on an acquisition of the largest parking operator in North America, a company called SP Plus. We invested about 18 months ago in a business called Metropolis. Metropolis is a tech provider. Um, they've dramatically you know incre they've, dr they've dramatically improved the parking experience uh, through the deployment of technology and cameras, and so you can you know pull into a lot. There's a, uh, a picture of your, of your license plate that's, that's taken. Then you actually register at one point in time. You associate your credit card, and then you can go in and out of any of their operated lots seamlessly, and you get a text, and you get charged. Um, SP, we're, you know, we've, we've proven out the, uh, uh, the investment thesis by acquiring a business called uh, Premier, Premier Parking, based in Nashville, um, and have you know, dramatically improved the profitability of the parking operator and are now in the process of acquiring the biggest parking operator in, in North America. 
um, in deploying the technology and, 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 and really driving a lot of um, efficiencies for not only the consumer, but you know, for the lot owner as well. That's great. Tangible examples always really bring things to life. So no more wardens, just uh, cameras. <laughs> cameras and text. But Ad, um, you, know, you, you have a, a large portfolio. So maybe tell us what's happening within Clear Lake at the portfolio company level on, on the technology side. Yeah, no, we have a, uh, we have a significant portfolio. I think uh, you know, we've been fortunate where you know, since 2001, to your point, Adam, on DPI, we have been focused on exits. I think we returned something like 17 or 18 billion, but we still have a big, <laughs> big portfolio, a lot of employees. I think a uh, few, few interesting, I would say, t uh, tidbits, data points. Um, second half of last year, uh, so Q2, Q3, Q4, 22, res you know, responding to the rate environment, expecting, frankly, a bigger economic slowdown. We saw in 23, we took out about 15-ish percent of OPEX across the, the, the software and tech portfolio. And again, I think as I look at results in, in 23, organic growth is actually up relative to what we forecasted. Margins are up. So I think there's, there's a thesis here around scale, you know, recurring businesses uh, that are critical, mission critical to customers that uh, can frankly grow through a slower economy. Uh, so I think one, you know, I think we're, we're benefiting from some of the scale assets and some of the work we did early, and I guess that, that's one element of, of, of private markets and private equity and control private equity, where we were able to react in a matter of 60, 90 days. I talked to a lot of friends on the growth side or venture side where there are seven, eight investors. No one's really driving the, the business. There's a hesitation by management to, to take make different decisions and difficult decisions. A lot of these companies, by the way, that we ended up lean, you know, right-sizing, they significantly grew headcount through COVID. So it's not like, you know, we're cutting it to the bones. It was more around making things more efficient, re redeploying some of the, frankly, capital that was invested in people in different areas, right? So it's not about just cost cutting, but it's about making businesses more efficient to improve organic growth. So I think here we were able to be fairly decisive in taking action. Um, I would say, uh, interesting point, one of the benefits, one of the upsides of, of a slowing market and valuation environment is we're able to do add-on acquisitions at much more attractive values. Uh, again, expectations were sky high. It was hard to almost make anything make sense that's accretive. Uh, you know, right now we're able to do acquisitions that are accretive from a product fit standpoint, but also from a cash flow and from a multiple standpoint. So I think that's something that, you know, you've got to add to your toolkit. Uh, to, to buy and build platforms b beyond just operating improvement and improving organic growth. Uh, Tony touched it a little bit, or you asked about uh, technology and AI. We do think AI as it relates to making sales, uh, customer support more efficient, GNA and sales and marketing functions, even in uh, R&D, making code testing, uh, you know, uh, code kind of, you know, validation, security patches, et cetera, more efficient at using predictive analytics and AI to do that, we think that could mean a 10% or so, uh, you know, a, a third savings from maybe 30 to 40% of your cost structure, right? So it's a, it's a meaningful 10% of your overall OPEX could, could be efficiency, which whether it's deflationary or improving margins, we think, you know, AI as applied in sales and marketing, GNA even development will, will drive operating profits and will drive efficiency and better products, faster to market, more responsive, react, you know, kind of, you know, ability to service customers and provide support. So we do think it's a big, big driver. Uh, it's one of the good news, you know, unlike some of the crypto, this is actually real. There's business application. There's, you know, it's, it's as real as blockchain or anything else. So this is, this is one that I think will drive kind of a spate of corporate profitability, efficiency, and I think it's here sooner than people think. So I think we're going to see that play out in public companies and a lot of private companies come next latter part of this decade. Thank you, Badan. So, Natasha, AI has been mentioned several times on this panel, and it's been mentioned many, many times already today, but maybe just talk to me a little bit about Wellington and what you're doing in the broader asset management business as it relates to um, you know, your organization and then how you then are, are making improvements internally or you're sort of harnessing that in the outside world to benefit you? So um, I think there are three ways that 
we think about how AI is going to impact on what we're up to. Um, one area that I can get very excited about, which goes back to the ingenuity and the growth and how to get excited, um, one of our team was talking to me about, about an investment that we have made in a company that is using AI to sort through recycling. And they are using that as a program in emerging markets to really get to the point of being efficient. And that is, I just think you can get super excited about those types of companies that are making genuine improvements and using AI in a lovely way. And that's on the private side. But when you think about public markets, I would probably say AI has sort of been around for a long time. There are experts within our quant investment team, for example, that have been talking about these large language models for a long time. They use it in algo trading. They use it in modeling factors. We had a conversation earlier today with, a, with somebody that was saying they, they use that all the time. So I think there are elements where it's already been in markets for some time. The trick is, how is it going to impact companies today? Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? What does that look like? We have access to so much information. We haven't talked about data as an asset class. Yeah. I really think data is critical. How you use it, where you store it, how you clean it, how you look after it, that is going to be so important. It's already important today. It's going to get even more important in the future because there's now so much more of it. Um, so when we think about how we run our business, what we want to do is try and harness all of the expertise that we have within our individual investment boutiques and our research teams who are doing all of these conversations with companies. We also want to harness people like our CISO, our Chief in, uh, Investment Security uh, Officer, trying to make sure that we're connecting everything that we're doing in technology with what we're hearing from the companies we invest in and then pulling all of that together as an ecosystem so that we can improve what we're doing day to day as well as make, making better investment decisions in the boutiques that, that we look after client assets. Um, and I'm also quite self-conscious about this because I get reverse mentored <laughs> by a number of my <laughs> analysts who are using it all the time to improve the code that they're writing or to get access to data in a faster way. So I'm very, very lucky that I have fabulous analysts that keep me on the straight and narrow. But we use it all the time in how we're running the business, how we're investing. Um, but it, the critical point is how is the companies that we all spend time looking at going to use it? And the divergence between those that are going to capture it and those that isn't, we think is getting wider. So act actually, whether you're private or public, active asset management and staying on top of these things, I think is going to be critical. That's great. So Don, I see you smiling and nodding <laughs> as, as Natasha talks about the, the world of AI. Maybe just, again, take us into the world of, of sports and media investing and reflect on the use and applicability of, of AI w within your industry. Yeah, just like any other companies, there's efficiencies that can be created. And the biggest one, from my perspective, is one that many fans care about, is the health of the players. Uh, and, you know, for years there have been moves forward on collecting data about performance, when somebody gets hurt, how they get hurt, what caused that injury. The more data we get from these players as they move around, the more we can create programs that are specific to them, understanding who they are, that will help prevent injury, right? I've and just realized you've also got I've a got a whoop, yep. I've got an yep. aura, I've got all sorts of things. Because <laughs> I'm such an elite athlete. Um, so, so that's number one. That's important. Um, and that's going to help us on the cost side. Uh, the, the second thing I'd say is, is much more on the consumer side of this. And this goes to what can AI really do in sports? Now, the good news is, unfortunately, well, the, the good news for sports is that AI can't replace a game, right? We've all seen uh, the AI-generated musicians, and you've seen Drake making songs that aren't Drake, and you've seen you know, screenwriters get replaced by AI. That's terrible. That's not going to happen in sport. What you can do, though, is the following, and this is tangible. So, so let's say you're somebody that likes to watch uh, a, a basketball game. And for me, in New York, there's a guy named Walt Frazier who has been uh, an announcer for 30 years. At some point, he won't be. But I would like to continue to watch games broadcast by Walt Frazier. There's a way in which I could do that. And in fact, with AI, let's say I'm somebody that loves data. I could have Walt Frazier as a broadcaster giving me the data that I want. Let's say I'm in a bad mood. I need something that's funny. I could have Kevin Hart broadcast the game. Now, the question is, will I pay more for that? 
And you know, I've talked a little bit about technology coming into sport. The reason why it's so important is that for years and years and years, teams and leagues didn't know who their fans were. There was no interaction, right? They were behind this cable pay TV thing. Now, because of Amazon and Apple, there's starting to be a one-to-one -one relationship between team and, and fan, and that allows the team to provide fans what they want, right? And so if they know that I'm a big Kevin Hart fan, and they say, hey, would you like to watch this game in the voice of Kevin Hart? <laughs> yeah, here's more money, right? And that's, that's, that's good for the sports ecosystem. Oh, good. Thank, thank you, Don. So we're going to come to Fatima, one question, and then I have some Q&A. So I think the, uh, the barcode is flashing up, so please do post your questions. I, I have a couple already. But um, Fatima, one thing we've not talked about is private wealth investors. And again, in the world of private markets, very topical today, which is capital scarcity is around. But more importantly, private investors also want to access an asset class that traditionally institutional asset managers have accessed. So, so maybe just um, can you share some views on that? I know you have some views on this and, and maybe some advice for those people in the world of, of wealth management and how they should think about approaching private markets. Sure. I, um, well, now I'm going to answer you with my GP hat on. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, um, again, the business that I had uh, at Mubadala Capital is called Solutions. We started this year exactly for this reason. If you look at where, um, if you look at capital activity, it's in the regions you described, but it's also in pr private wealth because there is retail demand building up, wanting to access alternatives. And what we've done is, we uh, tried to provide quote unquote an investment solution to these investors by creating a one-stop shop for, for alternatives. Because if you think of these investors, they don't have the capabilities or the bandwidth that we do. They don't have the depth uh, expertise um, or resources that we do. So how do you create something that's uh, a pre-packaged uh, alternative access to them in a bite size that they can consume? And what we created is basically a minimum by that capital. So we put everything we have under one roof. We spoke to a lot of the investors, especially in the region, to try and understand what their pain points are. Things like they're not used to capital calls. So to them, they don't want to deal with the uncertainty of cash flows uh, that uh, is very normal in our world. Um, other things that uh, are very live and current to the markets today, like uh, they want to see more liquidity. Uh, they want to have a distributing asset class. So we basically wrap the fund uh, in a structure that addresses all these issues. And then we injected about 3 billion assets uh, into it. So what we basically provide investors is not just diversified access to alternatives, but an instant access. And now we're talking to a lot of the channels in the private wealth space to see how we can work hand in hand uh, to distribute a product like this. But there's definitely a lot of demand for it. It's, it's, yeah. it's a very interesting space and it's a very different um, mentality that you need to have when talking to investors there. Yeah, we, at Hamilton Life, we would absolutely agree with that. The number of um, sort of traditional wealth managers talking to us about how to access the broader private markets is, is, is definitely very significant. So, so I have a couple of questions here. Um, and, and the first one may, may, may be hard to avoid in, in the city of light blue, Man City, that we have a question on the dark blue, so, so Chelsea. And so maybe just, I, I'm not sure, uh, Bedad or, or Tony, if you, if you want to talk about this, but it was more just a reflection on the investment in, in Chelsea and, and, and how you see that going today. Sure. Well, then I start, and Tony, Tony can add. Listen, I think if you take uh, Chelsea and sports and football out of it, and you say there was a world-class asset that was only due, you know, up for sale due to, frankly, you know, a war and yeah. government intervention, there's an opportunity to step in, partner with, uh, you know, Tony and Todd and Eldridge, buy it, and uh, try to make it better, right? Try to uh, bring more business, softer. Uh, commercial sales and marketing discipline, try to, you know, uh, add data, add, uh, add more kind of talent management to the sporting side in a, in a, in arguably the, you know, maybe inarguably the best league in the world for football, the Premier League. Um, and that was the thesis. And I think uh, to Don's point, highly uncorrelated with the, uh, you know, with, with the economy, it's probably one of the only things uh, that's been invested in by anyone in private equity in the past 18 months has had multiple expansion. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of good things that uh, 
City and Man City and Farhan and Khaldun have done uh, with Man City that, uh, you know, I think that that's there for us and others to follow and uh, continue to improve the league and the team. Yeah, no, so Eldridge has an investment in the, in the Dodgers, uh, as in, in, in Todd has an investment in the Dodgers uh, personally. Um, and, and I've, you know, been in and around and, and, and helped Todd with his, you know, investment in the Lakers uh, and Chelsea, but he did that, you know, personally away from, away from Eldridge and I've had the, you know, pleasure of getting to know, you know, Badad through that, that process. And I think that, you know, the two of them have put together a world-class team and, you know, are in the process of, you know, significantly investing in, you know, the players and player development. Um, and, you know, will be, you know, year in, year out competing for, you know, the title in the Premier League is, 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 is my view, despite the, you know, the frustrating loss last night. <laughs> it's a long season and it's hard there out on the pitch. But maybe, Don, uh, you, you made a comment about valuations of sports teams being sky high. Maybe just, I think, somebody in the audience just asking you to expand a little bit on that. Well, they've continued to go up over time. Uh, I would never say that they're sky high now on a relative basis. Uh, what you've seen is over time, year in, year out, 15, 18, 20, 25 percent. And that's through great financial crisis, that's through COVID, right, when people literally couldn't go to the matches anymore. Valuations continue to go up. To Badad's point, right, we've seen a lot of messiness in the last two years. But when you look around at the stories, whether it's the Commanders, whether it's the Phoenix Suns, you continue with it, you know, Dallas Mavericks, the Indianapolis Pacers, you continue to see uh, valuations move, move up. And that's because people see what the future is. One of the things that's lost on folks is, is when you look back in the days of 2005, 2010, you had people like Todd and Eldridge going into, and Guggenheim going into sports. You had people who were world-class investors, Josh Harris, Wes Edens, David Blitzer, Mark Lazary, Tony Ressler, I could go down the line, people were making investments, right? Where we are right now, right? People were coming into sports because they saw what these assets were. And only now are institutions saying, well, wait a minute, these guys made a ton of money, right? Because this is, this is such a good asset class. Now it's time for us to participate in that. And so I, I, I think we'll continue to see valuations go in the right direction. So, so Fatima, I just want to come to you, and so I, I think particularly where you sit at Mubadla Capital. So there's a question around sort of geopolitics and a disparity in growth rates. And so the question is more, what is happening to the alternative allocation to emerging markets? So not the established North America, not the established Europe, but actually have you, you seen any changes in the asset flows there? Well, uh, if I talk about Mubadar Capital more specifically, yep. we uh, invest predominantly in developed markets. Yep. Mubadar, on the other hand, has had a lot of very successful activity uh, in both markets. I think, uh, for example, we just opened our office in Beijing uh, a few weeks ago. And again, we're long-term investors. Yep. I mean, this, we transcend uh, what's happening <coughs> currently in the markets. Uh, the one uh, area maybe that I can comment on is Brazil. So Brazil, for example, we've built a very special business there in emerging markets. We continue to have strong conviction in this space. We've deployed about $5 billion uh, over the past 10 years. So I think for us, it's really uh, being mindful about which markets are we very um, close to and understand well, regardless of uh, all the other noise in the market. And that's where we really deploy our capital. But the majority of our activity is in developed markets, and that hasn't changed. Yeah, OK, good. Well, um, our time is up. I, I would like to thank my panel. Um, thank you for all your comments. Thank you for working with me um, on, on this panel. And, and also thank you to the audience for, for joining and listening today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.